somewhere outside of Nashville, Tennessee. This is the award-winning podcast, Terror Reality. Good evening, everybody, and thanks for listening tonight. My name is Sandman, and I'll be your guide through this strange realm of ghosts, cryptids, UFOs, aliens, conspiracy theories, and other unsolved mysteries that I like to call parareality. You know, it's been a long time since I've done a show about mysterious disappearances, or a mysterious disappearance. Everybody loves a good mystery, especially one that hasn't been solved for over 40 years. It gives us all a chance to put on our Sherlock Holmes deerstalker hat, don our capes, and put a pipe in our mouths and play detective, right? Well, I recently learned about a case so mysterious and bizarre that it seems like it could only happen in a movie. In fact, it's so bizarre that it's been termed the American Date Law of Pass Mystery or commonly known as the Yuba County Five Mystery, this case involves five adult men, all with some sort of mental disability, who mysteriously disappeared on a mountain in the winter of 1978. Four months later, the remains of all but one of them were found, which only served to deepen the mystery of how they disappeared. But more importantly, why did they disappear? To learn more, you'll have to turn on, tune in, and find out. This episode, usually, let me back up, usually I like to do what I call a summer series during the summer months. In June, July, and August, I'll take... uh, I'll do one episode a month that has a common theme to it. Uh, one of the most common was the one that I've I've done a, more than one. I've done a two or three on uh, the Nazis and all of their conspiracies and weird occult stuff and things like that. Um, and this year I was going to do it on the Yuba County Five, but unfortunately, uh, as as life sometimes does in my chaos that I call my life, I had was forced to take a uh, an unscheduled break. So uh, I didn't get to uh, do a summer series this year. So I had this planned as my summer series. So I'm just going to go ahead and do it. So the next three episodes are going to be what would have been my summer series just a little bit late this year. And it's going to be on the Yuba County Five. So get your magnifying glass out, put some fresh tobacco in your pipe and get ready to follow the clues, because the game is afoot. But before I get into the Yuba County Five, I got some fan mail. This comes from Cynthia via YouTube. This is short and sweet. Cynthia via YouTube. Cynthia says, where is your channel at? Well, Cynthia, if you're on YouTube, on my channel, and you're asking me where it's at, I think you've already found it. Um, I think more or less what you were saying, asking me, Cynthia, is uh, where have you been? Where are your new episodes? Uh, So, yeah, I I told everybody that I would um, fill you in on, you know, what's been going on with my life and everything. And, and I am, I'm just not going to do it right now. I just had to take a, my, my life is, is chaos, unfortunately. And uh, I, I had so many things going on. I had to take a short break. It was, it was unscheduled as uh, sometimes I have to do that. Um, maybe I need to start thinking about busting up my, my seasons a little bit shorter, you know, cause I usually run an 11 month long season. I just go uh, from January to November and then I take the month of December off. Most people don't do that when they're doing episodic or seasonal type podcasts. Um, so maybe I need to look at that, but I just enjoy doing it so much. I don't know. 
But yeah, so Cynthia, thanks for asking me where I've been. Um, just keep listening. I'll probably go into it a little bit more on the next episode of uh, Periality. Um, but yeah, everything's fine. Nothing, no disaster or anything like that. Everything's been fine. I've just had uh, just had a lot going on. So thanks, Cynthia, for writing in. And if you've got a question or a comment about the show, please feel free to get in touch with me. You can do it like Cynthia did via my YouTube channel, uh, Parareality1 on YouTube. Or you can email me, sandman at parareality.com. You can uh, send me a message through my social media accounts. Um, Facebook, the official Facebook Parareality page is uh, sandman.parareality on Facebook. Or just go to Facebook and do a a Facebook search for uh, Parareality. Uh, On my uh, Twitter and Instagram accounts, you can follow me there at Para Real Radio, both of those at Para Real Radio. And finally, you can call me 615 692 1170. That is the number here to the studio in the secret bunker. So if you've got a question or a comment about the podcast that you want to ask, or just a, a comment that you, you want, you just want to drop, like, hey, you suck, or hey, this is the best, or whatever, uh, feel free to use all those different methods to get in touch with me, and I'll go over them again at the end of this episode. So once again, thanks, Cynthia, for your question. So, as I said, this is going to be in three separate episodes. This first episode here, I'm just going to be introducing you to the Yuba County Five, telling you a little bit about the story behind everything. And part two will go into the evidence of what's been found or discovered for the Yuba County Five. And then uh, we'll wind everything down with part three, where I will um, basically present some different theories as to what could have happened to the Yuba County Five and end it up that way. So three parts to this podcast episode my summer series on the Yuba County Five. But uh, since I just answered Cynthia's email, of course, it is time for a commercial. So take a listen to this for me. Era Reality is a proud member of the Straight Up Strange Podcast Network. To learn more about all the awesome podcasts that are members of the Straight Up Strange family, go to straightupstrange.com and get strange. Hey, how would you like to be an agent of chaos? What is chaos? It's the knowledgeable apprentices of Sandman, and that's what I call my Patreon account members. I'm looking for new agents, and I'd love it if you'd sign up to become one. There are three levels of agents, and all are extremely affordable, $5 a month or less. Each level offers exclusive content along with the ability to help create podcast episodes and even the chance to be a guest or a co-host. To learn more, head on over to patreon.com slash parareality. 100% of the proceeds from Patreon goes back into producing quality content for this podcast. You are listening to the Parareality Podcast, your information source for conspiracy theories, UFOs, the paranormal, and all things unexplained. New episodes drop the first Friday of every month at 8 o'clock p.m. Central U.S. time. Listen on your favorite podcast station. Turn on, tune in, and find out. If you wish to change, you must first lift the veil of ignorance that has been cast over your eyes. Only then will you see the true power of the universe. On February 24th, 1978, a group of friends from Yuba County in California, Gary Dale Mathis, 25, Jack Madruga, 30, Jackie Hewitt, 24, Theodore Ted Weir, 32, and William Sterling, age 29, set out on a trip to watch a basketball game. They left after it finished 
and then somehow drove up a mountain into the wilderness and were never seen alive again. The case has been called the Mathis Group Incident, the Yuba County Five Case, and the American Date Law of Pass Incident. A date law of pass, in case you don't know what it is, refers to the unsolved deaths of nine hikers in the northern Ural Mountains in the Soviet Union, now Russia, between the 1st of February and the 2nd of February, 1959. The area in which the incident took place was named Datelov Pass in honor of the group's leader, Igor Datelov. The Russian case is as mysterious as the Matthias Group case in California's Pumas National Forest, which is what we're going to be talking about tonight. The group aged between 24 and 32 years of age, all had developmental disabilities and were enrolled in a day program for mentally handicapped adults. But that didn't mean that they were unable to function in society. In fact, it was quite the opposite. Out of the group, Gary Matthias had the most severe mental health. He was suffering from schizophrenia and was on medication to control his symptoms. Jack had a low IQ, but hadn't been diagnosed as mentally disabled, and both he and Gary had served in the United States Army, and both of those guys had driver's licenses. Matthias took uh, Stelazine and Cogentin. Both are used in the treatment of schizophrenia. Police records showed that he had become violent on occasion and was charged with assault twice. After his return from the Army uh, service in Germany, he would fail to take his medication and lapse into a disoriented psychosis that usually landed him in a VA or Veterans Administration hospital. Now, a side note about the medications that Matthias was taking. Stelazine is an antipsychotic drug that was discontinued for use in the United States back in 2004. Cogentin is a benztropine, which is used for treatment of Parkinson's disease and is in a class of drugs called anticholinergics. Now, these drugs help rebalance irregular activity of acetylcholine neurotransmitters, which are crucial to brain muscle function. In the case of its use by Matthias, it was being used to treat drug-induced Parkinsonium, the medical term for symptoms that mimic Parkinson's disease. This type of use is called an atypical use. Atypical antipsychotics also influence a chemical messenger known as serotonin, Atypical antipsychotics are typically prescribed to treat schizophrenia and to augment the treatment of major depressive disorder, bipolar disorder, and schizoaffective disorder. Now, how do I know all that? Well, I am in my medical profession, or my, my, my uh, day job, I am in the medical profession. I'm a nurse and a paramedic, so I deal with these drugs occasionally, and I kind of know a little bit about what they do. So why am I taking, why am I telling you about these drugs? Well, neither of the two medications that Matthias was taking are known to have any type of side effects that would make a person violent or have some otherwise unruly behavior. And the reason that I'm telling you all this will make more sense later on, so remember what I just told you, okay? Cogentin improves muscle control and has been shown to decrease rigidity and tremors associated with Parkinson's disease. Just a little side note on that. Now, Ted Weir was employed for a little while as a janitor and a snack bar clerk, but he quit at the urging of his family who thought that his slowness, his mental slowness was causing problems. Jackie Charles Hewitt, who had a slight droop to his head was sometimes slow to respond and he and Weir were just like best friends. As a matter of fact, Weir, he looked after Hewitt in a protective sort of way and would dial the phone for him when uh, Hewitt had to make a phone call. Jack Antone Madruga was a high school graduate and an Army veteran. 
He was laid off in November 1977 from his job as a busboy at Sunsweet Growers. William Lee Sterling, who was Madruga's special friend and also deeply religious, would spend hours at the library reading literature to help bring Jesus to patients in mental hospitals. Gary Dale Mathias was an assistant in his stepfather's gardening business and an Army veteran with psychiatric discharge after a drug problem that developed in Germany five years previous. On Friday, February 24th, these five men drove about 50 miles north from Yuba to Chico to attend a college basketball game. When the game ended, the California State this was it was at the California State University, and it was probably around 10 o'clock at night. They stopped three blocks away when they were headed home at Bears Market, um, and the clerk there said that they were kind of uh, annoying because he was he was trying to close up, and these five guys come in. And it just kind of ticked him off a little bit. And that's why he remembered them, because they came in when he was trying to close. And what they bought is kind of interesting. They bought one Hostess cherry pie, one Langendorf lemon pie, one Snickers bar, one Marathon bar, two Pepsis, and a quart and a half of milk. That's going to come into play later. But I'm just saying this because... It's not enough food to sustain these men for any length of time, okay? So that's kind of the backstory behind these five men, a little brief synopsis of who they were, what kind of mental handicaps they had. Now, we move on to the search for these missing men because the next day they failed to return from Chico, and their families, well, naturally they were concerned So they called the cops. They were supposed to play a basketball game of their own on February 25th. Now, this was part of a tournament with a free week in Los Angeles as the grand prize. Now, their clothes had been laid out the evening of the 24th before they left Chico with uh, uh, the Gateway Gators on on their uh, jerseys. That was what they called them. so from the, they left from the Yuba City Vocational Rehabilitation Center for the Handicapped where they all played in this basketball league. Weir had asked his mother to wash his new white high-top sneakers for the tournament, and he said, we got a big game on Saturday. Don't let me oversleep. So he was excited. They all were excited. When they didn't come home, their families called the police and the county sheriff's department began the search for these men. So on Tuesday, February 28th, a forest ranger found Jack Madruga's car abandoned. It was on an unpaved road near Oroville in the uh, Rogers Cow Camp area past Elk Retreat at an elevation of 4,500 feet. The car was a turquoise and white 1969 Mercury Montego, and it was about a two and a half hour drive from Chico in the opposite direction from the route they would have been expected to drive home, and it was way up in the mountains in the Pumas National Forest. Police found no evidence of foul play at the side of the car, but The car was unlocked, one window was down, and the keys couldn't be located. There were candy wrappers, milk cartons, and basketball programs that were found in the car, but any maps that they might have been using were stowed away in the glove compartment. There was no obvious damage to the car, Despite the bumpy, man-made dirt road, it had around a quarter of a tank of gas in it, and it wasn't stuck in the snow. The driver had either used really, really good care and precision, 
or else he knew the road well enough to anticipate every rut that was in the road. And that was something that the investigators kind of found um, suspicious because why would a person who is several hours away from his home be that familiar with this type of road up this mountain? It wasn't a place that a lot of people went. Now, the forest rangers searched the area for five days, but they didn't find any trace of these five men. But soon after the search began, unfortunately, there was a severe blizzard that moved into the area, and it covered up any potential tracks that could have been used or found. Around nine inches of snow, in fact, dropped on that mountain. The search teams nearly lost men themselves two days later because their snowcats were struggling through these snow drifts, and it became very perilous and dangerous. And there was no news for months as the spring snows melted on the mountains. Then in June 1978, a man riding his motorcycle through the area noticed a broken window on a Forest Service trailer. The trailer was located about 19 miles up the mountain from where the car was found. Now, 19 miles in heavy snow is a really, really tremendous hike if you don't have the proper equipment in. And a Forest Service snowcat ran up the road to the trailer on February 23rd, leaving a packed path in the snow that the men might have followed, but it was 19 miles away. And that is a long hike when you're not prepared to do so and you don't have the proper clothes. Now, getting back to the trailer, inside of that trailer, this man found the body of Ted Weir. Search and rescue teams then began combing the area around the trailer. And the day after Weir's body was discovered, searchers found the remains of Madruga and Sterling. They lay on opposite sides of the road to the trailer, about 11 and a half miles from the car. Madruga had been partially eaten by animals and dragged about 10 feet to a stream, and he lay face up, his right hand curled around his watch, and Sterling was found in a wooded area scattered over about 50 feet. There wasn't anything left to him but bones. He had been pretty much totally consumed. Two days later, just off the same road, but much closer to the trailer, Jackie Hewitt's father found his son's backbone along with a pair of Levi's and ripped, sold, get theirs shoes. An assistant sheriff from Plumas County found a skull the next day, about 100 yards downhill from the rest of the bones, which the family dentist used to identify the remains. Hewitt's remains were located northeast of the trailer, like Sterling's and Madruga's northwest of the trailer, about a quarter mile away. Searchers found three wool forest service blankets and a two-cell flashlight lying by the side of the road. The flashlight was slightly rusted and had been turned off, so it was impossible to tell just how long it had actually been there. Now, they found no sign of Gary Mathias. His sneakers were inside the Forest Service trailer, which suggested to the investigators that he might have taken them off to put on Weir's leather shoes, particularly since Weir had bigger feet and Matthias's feet might have been swollen from frostbite, was an assumption. Now, although the men's bodies were heavily decomposed, autopsy results determined that they had likely died from exposure. It appeared that Ted had lived somewhere an estimated time of between 8 and 13 weeks after his disappearance based upon the length of his beard and around a 100-pound weight loss. He weighed just 120 pounds at the time of his death. Several bed sheets and a shroud were tightly tucked over his body, indicating that someone else had been with him in the trailer because he couldn't have bundled himself up the way he was found. His leather shoes were off, and as I said, they were missing. 
A table by the bed held his nickel ring with the word Ted engraved on it, his gold necklace, his wallet, which did have money inside of it, and a gold Waltham watch. Its crystal was missing, which the families say uh, had not belonged to any of the five men. Ted's feet were also badly frostbitten. But then the story takes an even stranger turn. Inside the trailer, authorities found heavy clothing, matches, playing cards, books, wooden furniture, and other materials that could have easily been used to start a fire. But there had been no apparent attempt to do this despite the freezing temperature on the mountain. A propane tank connected to the trailer, which could have provided a ready source of heat and cooking fuel, was untouched. Yuba County Sheriff's Department Lieutenant Lance Ayers said all they had to do was turn that gas on and they would have had gas to the trailer and heat. Now, in a storage shed outside, there was a year's supply of sea rations. Now, these were individual canned, pre-cooked, and prepared meals issued to the U.S. military. The men consumed 36 of the meals but left the majority of them untouched. In addition, there was a huge supply of freeze-dried meals, and one of the sea ration cans had been opened with an Army P-38 can opener. So all five of these friends had been together for several years. Basketball was their favorite pastime, and all five men were part of the Gateway Gators, a basketball team sponsored by the local program for the mentally handicapped. If they weren't playing, they were watching. And if they weren't doing that, they were hanging out together. And this was all the time. Due to their special needs, all of the men lived with their parents either in Yuba or nearby in Marysville. And the families affectionately recalled the group of boys, the boys. Ted Weir was incredibly friendly with everyone he met. As an adult, he would often wave excitedly at strangers and would become really upset for hours if they didn't wave back at him because he thought that he had done something wrong. Ted once bought $100 worth of pencils for no particular reason. Bill Sterling was close friends with Ted Weir. He had known him for eight years. One of Weir's favorite things was to call Sterling and read him funny-sounding names from the newspaper. While close with Weir, he considered Madruga... His best friend, though, Sterling was very religious and was known to visit people in mental hospitals and read the Bible and other religious texts to them. He loved to read and spent a lot of time at the library doing research about mentally handicapped people. Now, Jack Madruga served in Vietnam in 1968. He was called Doc by his friends and family and his most prized possession was that 1969 Mercury Montego that I was talking about. He would never allow anyone but himself to drive it. And according to his mother, he was never officially diagnosed as quote-unquote mentally retarded. I know that's not a politically correct term these days, but that's according to his mother. That's his mother's terms, where she said that he was never diagnosed officially as being mentally retarded, but he was generally thought of as slow. And according to his family, Jack was able to manage his own finances, so he did at least have that much mental capability. Now, Jackie Hewitt lived on a farm with his family where they, where he'd play with his, uh, his, his dog, his beagle, Bo, and he rode a dirt bike around the property. Now, Hewitt thought of Weir like a big brother, and the feeling, according to friends and family, was mutual. These two guys were pretty much inseparable. And Weir uh, would oftentimes make phone calls for Jackie Hewitt because making phone calls caused Hewitt to become anxious. Now, he couldn't read or write. He was very shy, and he had a speech impediment, and reportedly... um, It was uh, his IQ, and we're talking about Jackie Hewitt here, 
his IQ was somewhere around 40. So he had a severe mental handicap. Gary Mathias, he wore really thick glasses because he had incredibly poor eyesight. And if he didn't have his glasses, he couldn't see. And um, they said that he also suffered from double vision as well. So his poor eyesight came about as a result of a head injury after he had fallen out of a moving car. He had a terrible head injury and was blind for about four days, and his vision never fully returned, so he was forced to wear those thick Coke bottle glasses. Matthias hadn't shown any sign of mental illness as a child. It's suspected that this accident may have been a prominent factor in his onset. Matthias was a big fan of the Rolling Stones, and prior to his disappearance, he had been the lead singer of a local rock band called The Fifth Shade. According to his sister, they had even once won a battle of the bands at the Yuba Sutter Fairgrounds. At the time of his disappearance, Matthias was dating his high school girlfriend, Lisa. So, why do I tell you all these things about the boys? Because it's important that you know the kind of people that they were. Yes, they all had handicaps mentally, some more severely than others, but they all had enough sense to know the direction that they were traveling in. They all had enough sense to get in out of the cold, and at least one or two of them should have been intelligent enough to know how to turn on the gas in that trailer and that there was enough food in that trailer to last those guys for quite a while, at least until spring got there where they could have maybe walked out and not froze to death. So what led them up that mountain in the exact opposite direction that they were supposed to be going in? What caused them to go that way? Were they coerced? Were they kidnapped? Did they just simply get lost? Well, if you remember that 1969 Mercury Montego that was Jack Madruga's prized possession was in almost pristine condition when they found it. It didn't look like it had been beaten up or banged up, almost as if whoever drove it up that dirt road on the side of the mountain was very familiar with every twist and turn in the road and very familiar with all the ruts. Now, those boys, they didn't go up that mountain, at least not that I found. They didn't go up there frequently. As a matter of fact, that was probably the only time that they did. So that kind of negates that Madruga would know all of these twists and turns and all these ruts in this car, and his car would probably have been a little bit more banged up, maybe a little bit more dirty on the undercarriage than what it was. So we have ourselves a mystery here. What happened to those five boys after that basketball game? Why did they go two and a half hours in a complete opposite direction from where they were supposed to go? What led them, or who led them, up the side of that mountain? Well, next episode, we're going to look at part two, the evidence of what was found of the Yuba County Five. And we're going to see if we can't piece together the puzzles of the evidence that was left behind and try to come up with a conclusion to this mystery. We're going to see if we can solve this thing for ourselves. But of course, as you know, if you want to know what the evidence is, you want to learn about the evidence, you'll have to turn on, tune in, and find out. And that about does it for this first episode of my summer series of the Yuba County Five. 
Next episode, we'll take a look at the evidence. And then episode three, we'll conclude everything down, wind it up, and see if we can't come up with some answers to this riddle. That about does it for the night. Thank you for listening. But before I close it out, take a listen to this. You do not like being scared. Just the feeling of your throat tightening in fear, leaving you unable to scream excitement. If the answer to these questions is yes, then you should listen to Scared to Death, stories of suspense, science fiction, and the horror. Scared to Death airs the third Friday of every month at 8 o'clock p.m. Central Time. Tune in for the fright of your life. fed up with the way things are going in the world? Have you always wanted to say whatever was on your mind without having to listen to someone bitch about it or suffer any repercussions? Well, me too. That's why I created the Set It Off podcast. I'm sick and tired of the stupidity that's going on around here, and I'm going to let everybody know how I feel about it. So hop on board this train and fasten your seatbelt because I'm about to set it off. Set It Off can be heard on your favorite podcast station. New episodes drop on the fourth Friday of every month at 8 o'clock p.m. Central Time. You never know what I'm going to say next. Well, as always, I hope you enjoyed tonight's episode of Parareality. If you want to leave a comment about it or ask me a question or anything else about the podcast, let me tell you how you can get in touch with me because there are a few different ways that you can do it, and here they are. The best, quickest, easiest way is to email me. My email address is sandman at parareality.com. That's sandman at parareality.com. Or you can find me on Facebook at the official Facebook page for the podcast, Parareality. Just go to facebook.com slash sandman.parareality. Or you can just, if you're in Facebook, just do a Facebook search for Parareality Podcast. You can post a message on my wall there, on my page, or you can uh, slide into my DMs and send me a message there. If you have a Twitter or Instagram account, you can follow me on both of those. My username is at Radio. That's at Radio, both on Instagram and Twitter. And finally, you can always call the podcast at 615 615- Six nine two one one seven zero. That is a direct line into the secret bunker here at Parareality. Leave me a message on that studio line. That number to call once again is six one five six nine two eleven seventy. Now remember this though: if you call and leave a message on the voicemail, you're giving me permission to play your comment back on the podcast. So if you do not want that to happen, you'll need to let me know somewhere in your message. Now, I'm always looking for interesting stories for the podcast. So if you have a story that you'd like to get on the show, you can tell it to me over the voicemail. There's about a three-minute time limit on the voicemail. So if you run out of time, call back and pick up where you left off. So once again, all those ways to get in touch with me real quick, I'm going to go through them again. Sandman at parareality.com is the email. You can find me on Facebook and post on the Facebook wall or send me a message on Facebook. Facebook.com slash sandman.parareality or just look up Parareality Podcast on your Facebook. Twitter and Instagram at Radio. That's at Radio. And you can call me on the studio line, 615-692-1170. That number again is 615-692-1170. Also, gang, please don't forget to visit my website, 
Parareality.com. This is a place where you can keep up on the latest paranormal news from all around the world. I got an entire page of the website devoted to paranormal news, and the content is updated almost daily. It's in the para news section of the podcast. You can also shop in the official Parareality store, watch some of the terrible videos that I've made for the podcast over the years, and even listen to the podcast archives. I've got an archive section on the website. And you can listen to all of the pair reality, just about all of the pair reality uh, past podcast episodes, absolutely for free. I got tons of audio on the website from the various incarnation incarnations of pair reality throughout the years, along with my other podcasts that I haven't done in a while. Set it off and scared to death. You can find all of that content for free in the archive section. Of the website. That's parareality.com. So make sure you check it out for me, guys. Parareality can be heard on your favorite podcast station. Just search for Parareality. If you've got a smart speaker, you can listen there too. Just say, hey, smart speaker name. Let's search smart speaker name here. Just say, hey, play the Parareality podcast. I've also got a YouTube account, and you can listen to the podcast there, too. It's full of some great videos like UFO and paranormal documentaries and my new segment called News of the Strange, and it's also got those terrible videos that I did on my very, very short-lived web TV show. I did about uh, six episodes, something like that, several years ago. It was a long time ago. I tried doing a, a, a just a a vlog or a video podcast. And, uh, of course, back then, I, we didn't have all the great equipment and stuff that we've got now, and I especially didn't have it. And it just wound up being like me, one camera angle, and that was about it. And it was horrible, absolutely horrible. I know it was horrible. Um, I didn't even finish out. I had... Uh, originally was going to do, I forgot how many episodes, and uh, I just quit because it was so horrible. I had signed on to do, God, I can't remember, like eight episodes or something like that, or ten. I can't remember how many it was, but I couldn't do it. It was just, it was terrible, so I quit. And uh, I had those uh, videos saved on an external hard drive for whatever reason, and I, you know, I needed content to put on my YouTube channel, so I'm like, well, what the hell? I'll put that up there and let people make fun of it. <laughs> I, you can say whatever you want about it. I know it sucks. So, uh, yeah, just uh, if if you're looking to waste some time, just uh, find my Para Reality uh, podcast page on on YouTube. It's uh, YouTube dot com slash user slash parareality one. That's the channel. Or you can just look go to YouTube and search for parareality one. That's the number one, not parareality one spelled out. It's parareality number one. And uh like I said, I've got some pretty good documentaries, public domain stuff there and and um um all of the um audio from this podcast is uploaded directly to YouTube. Um a lot of I get actually get a lot of people who uh, listen to the audio on YouTube. I don't know why. Maybe that's the only way they can find it. Maybe they're just, just a YouTube junkie and like it. I don't know. But uh, yeah, you can listen to the audio from YouTube if that just if that's something that you just you just got to do. You just got to go to YouTube and download the audio or listen to the audio, whatever. So yeah, man, it's it's all there. So, um, Para Reality One, they're on YouTube. And like I said, I've got some pretty good documentaries out there, uh, UFO, paranormal documentaries, um, that really horrible six or seven episode show, <laughs> web show that I did. It is disgustingly bad, but hey, I did it. So, like I said, feel free to make fun of that. Well, I've been rambling on long enough. It's about time for me to get out of here. The uh, next episode of Parareality will air on uh, next Friday, 
the 2nd of September at 8 o'clock p.m. Central U.S. time. We'll be diving into the second part of my summer series on the Yuba County Five, and we'll be taking a look at the evidence of what was found and see if that can't help us piece together the clues to help solve this mystery, this over 40-year-old mystery. So turn on, tune in, and find out. I hope that this podcast opens your mind up to new ways of thinking, expands your consciousness, and produces a change in the way you see the world. If you wish to change, you must lift the veil of ignorance that has been cast over your eyes. Only then will you see the true power of the universe. I hope you have a wonderful evening, great weekend, and I will see you again in one week next Friday. If you wish to change, you must first lift the veil of ignorance that has been cast over your eyes. Only then will you see the true power of the universe.